Hey everybody, how's it going? Let's talk about your home recording studio. Today we are going to take a look at what it would take to build a computer geared towards audio production. A couple of weeks ago I posted a poll and asked what you guys would like to see for my next video topic. And the winner of that was uh, building an audio computer. So uh, that same week I actually went to Micro Center, I set a budget of $500 and I bought all of the components uh, that it would take to build a budget audio production machine. Now before we get into the specifics, uh, some general things about an audio machine versus, you know, any other machine. What's the difference? Well, you know, there's not a whole lot of difference. When it comes down to it, audio, uh, even high resolution audio at high sample rates, uh, when it comes down to it, it's really not super demanding uh, compared to other tasks that a computer might be asked to do, like gaming or video editing or rendering, things like that. I mean, if you think about it, my little Zoom recorder here is actually recording uh, four channels of audio right now, uh, and it's just a little, you know, a little dinky box. The challenges really kind of come in whenever you want to start editing your audio and whenever you want to start using virtual instruments. Uh, so that's when some uh, other requirements come in here. So let's take a look at a couple of uh, just kind of quick pointers. So first, I would really recommend picking your CPU first because the CPU kind of tends to be the limiting factor of what all the machine is going to be capable of. I would say to get the nicest CPU you can afford within your budget and then fit everything else in around that uh, within your budget. If you end up with uh, too weak of a CPU, it can really, really make it a pain to use your computer. And uh, in an audio setting, uh, it'll probably limit how small you can make your ASIO buffer, uh, you know, get nice low latency and everything, uh, but that puts more pressure on the CPU. Uh, so you need a, a CPU that can at least handle that. Another big consideration, in my opinion, is how much RAM you're going to use, especially if you're going to be using uh, sample libraries and things like that. Uh, in today's world with Windows 10, I really wouldn't recommend anything under 8 gigabytes. And 8, I think, for an audio production machine is kind of cutting it close. I would rather see 16, uh, but right now memory is very expensive, so uh, maybe 8 will do for right now in a pinch. Another big thing is how loud is your computer? Uh, your home recording studio, your environment is probably already filled with all sorts of uh, ambient noises from your air conditioner to, who knows, kids playing outside to other noises in the household. The last thing you really want to do is add a computer that's going to add to that, that ambient noise that you're already probably dealing with. So really when it comes down to it, silence is golden. Uh, when you're choosing components for an audio workstation. And that comes down into your uh, CPU cooling uh, and your chassis fans, and even your power supply has a fan in it. So all of those fans, uh, choose wisely. You, I always say I get the biggest fan that my chassis can accommodate because the bigger fans can spin slower and still uh, move a fair amount of air. Uh, and they're not gonna uh, be super loud once they're spinning slower. Also, I kind of I tend to prefer PWM fans over DC fans. That's the four-pin connector versus the three-pin connector. Um, you might have better luck with the four-pin PWM type fans when it comes to controlling their speed. But some motherboards make it easy, and so it it may not matter. Uh, it just depends on which motherboard you end up choosing. And another big factor is expandability and connectivity. Because you want to make sure, since this is, you know, in 2018, so many things connect via USB. And so you just need to make sure that you uh, take a look at, at what all the connectors are and make sure you've got enough con connectivity for all of your components that you're going to be plugging into it. And also enough uh, internal connectivity, uh, things like PCI slots, to make sure that you, it, it can accommodate whatever uh, things that you're going to expect to be able to plug into it. All right, well, let's take a look here at the specific components that I picked for this build, and uh, you can kind of get an idea of kind of where my money went uh, for a $500 budget. All right, so first and foremost, uh, for the CPU, I ended up choosing an Intel i3-8100. This is Intel's uh, current generation as of 2018, is their eighth generation. The 8100 is a four-core uh, CPU with uh, no hyper-threading. 
it runs at 3.6 gigahertz, which is, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty darn impressive. Uh, and while I really used to rag on i3s because honestly, they used to suck. They used to just be these dual core kind of horrible little things. Uh, and in the eighth generation, they've come a long way. And I have to say this uh, CPU has really impressed me so far. All right, for a motherboard to put the CPU on, uh, I ended up with an MSI B360M Pro VDH. And that's a micro ATX motherboard, which is a small form factor, uh, which would allow you to put it in a nice kind of small compact case. And I ended up getting kind of a bundle deal uh, with uh, buying the CPU and the motherboard together. So it saved about 30 bucks there, which really helped the budget here. And uh, yeah, so far the motherboard has been uh, great. Uh, there's, I don't really have much uh, uh, requirements for connectivity inside the computer. I, I'm not running a graphics card in here. I don't have like an internal sound card or a Wi-Fi adapter or USB expansions or any of that stuff. So uh, yeah, it's, it's actually a pretty good deal. Now for memory, yes, like I mentioned, memory in 2018 is very expensive, which is really unfortunate. So I really wanted to do 16 gig for this build, but I, I just couldn't. Once I got everything else added to the shopping cart, uh, 16 gigs of memory was going to run something like uh, $180. And that was just too big of a chunk of a $500 budget. I couldn't squeeze and cut corners uh, enough elsewhere in the build to accommodate for that. So I ended up going with a single eight gig stick of Crucial Ballistic Sport. Uh, the eight, eight gigs, it's really served me fine so far. I haven't really run into that many problems. Uh, I, I've, uh, I could see though how that could be limiting for somebody that's using lots of sample libraries and stacking virtual instrument over virtual instrument over virtual instrument. And, um, I, yeah, I, I could see how that could be a problem. But the good news is memory is very easy to install. It, it's kind of uh, idiot proof. So down the road, once RAM prices drop, it, yeah, the, it'll be super easy to just grab another stick of uh, eight gig stick of memory, toss it in there and be good to go. Okay, now for storage, what I ended up doing here to fit the budget, I ended up getting uh, two different drives. And I actually do this in all my computers anyways, but um, I ended up going with an Inland Professional 120 gig SSD drive. And so that's a very small SSD drive, but it's very fast and very cheap. And so I'll install Windows and my applications to that. Uh, really, you could use it as an audio directory as well. You could record your projects to it, but just know that uh, you'll probably run out of storage in a hurry, but um, you could always save a few projects to it. And then once you're done with them, move them off to an external drive or a backup drive or something. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, it, just know that with only 120 gigs of storage, yeah, you're gonna start cutting it close uh, pretty quickly, especially if you're gonna try to load like a sample library to that drive. Uh, yeah, that's just going to chew up your storage. So in order to offset the cost of instead of getting a larger uh, SSD, uh, for mass storage, I ended up with a Toshiba P300 HDD, a hard drive. And this is a one terabyte drive. And so this is just big and cheap. That's the whole kind of point. It's just mass storage. And this is where I load sample libraries. It's where I'll record my audio projects to. It's where I'll keep anything that takes up a lot of space and that I don't necessarily care about how fast, super, super fast it is. The SSD is great to run Windows and applications on because it keeps boot time, uh, you know, very quick and snappy. It makes it where applications load really quick. When you click the button, you know, there they are. It's no toe tapping and waiting and uh, thumb twiddling or anything. But the, the Toshiba drive, the one terabyte hard drive is gonna be great for just mass storage. And uh, it, it actually performs very well. Now, when it comes down to uh, picking an HDD, I really wouldn't uh, select anything that spins slower than 7,200 RPM. Uh, and I wouldn't get anything that has anything older than like a SATA 3 connection on it. Those two things together are going to serve every purpose, serve every need that you have for recording audio, even multiple channels of high resolution audio, while also playing back multiple channels of high resolution audio should have no problem at all. Now for a power supply, I ended up going with a Cooler Master Master Watt Lite 500 watt. And this has plenty of overhead. Uh, 500 watt is way more than we need just for the CPU and, and all the internals of the computer. But there's plenty of overhead there in case you wanna add a graphics card or something later. Uh, that'll still have enough wattage left over to drive a pretty, you know, a fairly high horsepower graphics card just in case. 
Uh, it definitely is the loudest thing in the, uh, in the build here. It's not like super loud or anything, but it's the fan that I hear over all the other fans. And also it's not modular, which means all the cables uh, are permanently connected to it. So any cables I'm not using, rather than just being able to remove them and stash them in a box somewhere, have to find some place within the case to go stash all those cables so they're out of the way. And speaking of the cables, they are the kind of old, ugly, ketchup and mustard kind of cables. So, so uh, with, with a, a case like this that has an acrylic window that's meant to let you peer inside of the build, uh, those ugly red and yellow and orange and green and whatever different, all the multicolor cables are kind of unsightly, but at a budget build, what are you going to do? It's really not that big of a deal. All right, for CPU cooling, I ended up going with the tried and true Cooler Master Hyper 212. This is the LED version. Uh, although I did uh, ditch the LED fan that came with it and just replaced it with a better fan. Uh, but yeah, it seems to be doing an okay job. I wouldn't say it's just amazing, but for the price, uh, it does a pretty good job. And speaking of cooling for chassis fans, uh, for the rear exhaust, it's a single 120 millimeter fan, and I ended up going with a Cooler Master AF120. This is just a DC uh, three pin, just your basic fan. Uh, it seems to be doing an okay job. For the front, this chassis accommodates uh, two 140 millimeter fans in the front for intaking fresh cool air. And for those, I ended up going with the Cooler Master Maglev uh, 140 millimeter, and those are both PWM fans. And you know, I have to say, those have been doing pretty darn good. Uh, the 140 millimeters, you know, two of them, they move a lot of air uh, without making a whole lot of noise. And I ended up uh, swapping out, like I had mentioned, on the CPU cooler, I swapped out the default fan with a Noctua NF-F12. Uh, this is a, definitely a premium fan, comes at a premium price, and it's kind of ugly as sin uh, with that old beige and burgundy kind of uh, Noctua uh, color scheme on it. But it, it does a very good job. It's quiet, it's efficient, and it, it uh, cools very well without making a lot of noise. All right, and for the case itself that we see here, this is the Corsair Carbide Spec 02 Redshift. I can't say that I'm crazy about this case. Uh, the airflow is very good. Uh, building in it was fine. I, it was easy to build in. There's some accommodations for cable management and things like that, so that, that's all great. Uh, it's just the general aesthetic. It's the, these kind of red highlights and the big red Cylon looking uh, LED on the front. It just kind of has much more of a gamer look. It screams uh, adolescent gamer rather than audio professional. Uh, so, it, you know, aesthetically, not too crazy about it. Also, the acrylic window here is kind of pointless in this build because I don't uh, really have uh, anything worth showing off inside here. No LED lighting, no RGB and fancy components and everything. So it's just kind of a, a basic run-of-the-mill build here. That's <laughs> There's just nothing spectacular to see through the uh, uh, acrylic window there. All right, let's take a quick look at a time-lapse of the build process, and I'll see you guys here in just a couple of minutes. Okay, first things first, let's get the motherboard out of the box. What I like to do is use the motherboard box as a work surface to install things onto the motherboard. It's non-conductive and has a little bit of give to it. Nice workspace. So first, let's install the CPU. Handle it carefully, only by the edges. Don't touch the contacts or anything. Find the little notch on the edge of the CPU and match it up to the little tab on the CPU socket on the motherboard. Drop it into place. Don't use any force whatsoever. It'll just lay right in there. Go ahead and close the retention bracket. The little retention arm has a lot of tension on it, so uh, get it down into place there. And once it's in place, the little plastic cover will just pop right off. You can throw that away. All right, CPU is installed. Now let's install the RAM. You'll have to take a look at your motherboard instructions to see which slots uh, you need to install it into. There's only one way it fits. Push it in there, make sure it is well seated and the retention arms clasp in place. Now it's time for the CPU cooler. You will want to consult the manual more than likely for instructions on exactly how to mount the hardware. And first you'll want to install the mounting hardware both on the CPU cooler itself 
and install the mounting hardware on the motherboard. Now your CPU cooler may or may not come with thermal paste pre-applied to the cooler itself. Now, this one does not, but it did include a small little sketchy looking bag of uh, thermal paste and a little packet. I opted to use my own just to just, uh, put a little dab of thermal paste on the CPU itself, size of a couple of grains of rice or a small pea maybe. Also make sure you don't forget to install the rest of the mounting hardware like I did and we'll get that all in place. And then go ahead and install the actual cooler itself. Follow the instructions. Generally you want to tighten in a star pattern to even out the pressure it applies and also so that the thermal paste spreads evenly. Now go ahead and install the cooling fan onto the CPU cooler. Make sure it's in the correct orientation that it's uh, blowing in the direction you intend it to and plug it in to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. Okay, now with the CPU, the cooler, and the RAM installed, let's give this thing a test boot just to make sure that there are no defects or anything and uh, make sure we're not going to have to dig this back out of the chassis once we get it all installed. Let's uh, test boot it up while it's still outside of the chassis. So to do that, you're going to need the power supply and you'll want to plug in the 24 pin motherboard power. That's the big giant cable. And you'll also want to plug in the 8 pin CPU power. Now I am going to actually just go grab the case itself so that I can plug the front panel connectors into their respective ports on the motherboard so I can make use of the power switch and the reset switch from the computer case. So we'll get the case out of the box, go ahead and take off the panels, and yeah, let's get those fiddly little switches installed in the right spot, give it a test boot, and hey, look at that, we get front panel indicator, with the fan spinning, everything booted up. and even uh, got into the BIOS screen. So that's good. That means everything works. Now it's time to actually install everything in the case. All right, well, hopefully that time lapse kind of turned out okay. Sorry, I kind of petered out at the end. I didn't get around to installing the uh, drives or doing any of the cable management, but I got called into work and I ran out of time and blah, blah, blah. So over the next few days, I picked around at actually finishing up the assembly. And here we can take a, a couple of quick shots, some gut shots of what it uh, looked like. Really, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do once you get it uh, up and running, you make sure that it works, is you're gonna want to set uh, the fan curves in your BIOS. And that's really what's gonna determine how loud this machine is gonna be in your room. So let's do that real quick. Let's go ahead and power it on. And uh, once I see signs of life, I'm gonna start tapping the delete key here. Um, although I'm not exactly sure if my monitor turned on in time, yeah, there we go. Okay, so we get the uh, the BIOS screen. So for this motherboard, it's uh, tap delete while it's booting up. Uh, your motherboard may differ on what key you have to tap. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna wanna do is go over to this fan info, and you can see the curves that are set here. Let's take a look here. If I click on this little gear here under system fans, and let's crank them all the way up. Let's see what happens if, if they were just all running full speed all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, I tell you what. There is nowhere you could hide in a room uh, with a live microphone with that kind of noise. There is, that's just, that would be unacceptable. If your computer's making that much noise, oh man, trying to record in the same room with it is just gonna be a nightmare. Your microphone is gonna hear that sound, so. Uh, so let's uh, take a look. This is the default setting, uh, the way it was set whenever, uh, whenever I uh, just first installed it. 
let's have a listen to that. And yeah, yeah, that's definitely a lot better. But still, like that's uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That that's still kind of overbearing, and I have a feeling your mic is still gonna hear that even if it's you know halfway across the room. Uh, and if you're doing a lot of vocal tracks or acoustic guitar or thing, things like that with a live mic uh, and stacking those track over track, uh, that sound is going to get picked up on every track and it's just going to stack over and over and over. So let's do a little bit of work here and see how, what we can do to get it quieter than that while still giving sufficient cooling. So right now it looks like we are running at 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, ambient temperature in the room right now. Uh, let's see, that says 77. It'll take a couple of minutes to settle to what the temperature is right here, but uh, that's still a, a pretty good indication. 77 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. I don't know, that's, that's what, maybe 25, 26 uh, degrees Celsius? Somewhere in there. <laughs> I can't do that math in my head. I'll put it. I'll put what it really is uh, in, in the uh, in, in a caption here. Uh, but yeah, so we're idling substantially over uh, ambient. So that's the one thing about this processor. It definitely idles a little hot. The Cooler Master cooler, uh, even with the Noctua fan on there, is you know doing like a mm, mm, okay job. That's not hot enough to be worried, but that's pretty warm for idle temperatures. So maybe I'll uh, uh, reseat the cooler and just make sure that it's making good contact and that the spread of thermal paste is good and all that stuff. So anyways, let's uh, fiddle around with this a little bit. So on this screen here, System Fan 1 is the single 120 millimeter exhaust fan. That is a DC fan. So if I go ahead and uh, click on, yeah, let's leave it on DC and let's set it to smart fan mode. And so this curve right here is temperature versus how fast you want the fan to spin. So really what I would say is I don't want it to spin at all until we hit maybe like 30 degrees Celsius. And then it'll actually start spinning. Uh, and maybe by the time we hit 40 degrees Celsius, maybe we'll do it at like... Um, you know, somewhere around like one third power, like 30% power or something. So that sets a nice curve. I'll go ahead and leave these uh, points of the graph alone. And this green line here shows the fan speed. So we can see the like, oh yeah, the fan speed actually dropped off. So I have a feeling it's probably looking at uh, the system temperature and not the CPU temperature if it stopped spinning. And I look back in there and yeah, sure enough, you know, that, that fan has stopped spinning. So yeah, now that the, since the fan according to my settings here isn't needed, yeah, it's not even spinning. So it's not gonna make any noise. All right, let's do the same thing with the front fans, which is still what we can hear. You know, still making a fair amount of noise. So let's go to System Fan 2 here. And this is, System Fan 2 is both of the intake fans tied together with a splitter. So they are PWM fans. And let's go ahead and click Smart Fan Mode. And let's do the same thing. Let's say, you know, if, if it's uh, any cooler than 30 degrees Celsius, uh, let's not, uh, let's not run the fans at all. And then let's maybe get them up to 30 or 40% power by the time we hit like 40 degrees Celsius. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that'll do. And again, I'll, I'll leave the top end of this alone. So that, that'll set a nice curve for us. Okay, so now just with those settings, let's take a listen. And yeah, that's really not so bad could definitely live with this, you know, especially since that microphone is just right up on it. Uh, once this is distance from your microphone and, you know, wherever your computer is going to live in the room, like, I, I think that's going to be totally acceptable uh, as far as ambient noise being added by the cooling fans. Uh, as far as the CPU fan, I'm just going to leave it alone uh, at the default setting. Uh, there's really no circumstances under which I can think that we would want the CPU fan not spinning at all. And really with that nice, quiet Noctua fan, uh, I think this curve that's already set here is gonna do the job for us. Okay, well, we got our fans to shut up, so let's go ahead and boot into Windows and let's see how this thing is performing. Okay, now that we're booted into Windows, let's just take a quick look at the performance here, just at baseline. We just booted, there's nothing else running. 
So we take a look at Task Manager, and if you're not familiar with Task Manager, oh man, get familiar with it. Uh, for Windows, it's just your friend. It's a great one-stop shop to see how your system's doing as far as performance. So we can see the CPU is under very, very little load, you know, about 1%, um, just baseline, bumping up to 4 or 5% because we did just boot up, so uh, it's doing some background startup kind of tasks and everything, but that should settle and be a pretty consistent 1% here before too long. For baseline memory usage, so it looks like we're using about 1.5 gig out of our 8 gig total. Uh, so that's just baseline here, so that's not so bad at all. Got plenty of overhead there. So let's uh, fire up Reaper. So I, I've got it paired with uh, the Roland Rubix 22 uh, and uh, just sending output from that into my recorder so you can hear what we're doing here. So let's fire up Reaper and let's see how it does here. Uh, Reaper is going to give me its little nag screen because I haven't uh, uh, transferred my license over to this computer yet. So pardon me for one moment. All right, so in this uh, fairly uh, simple looking little project here, so I've recorded this project all uh, on this computer through Reaper here, uh, through the Roland Rubix 22. It's a bit of a, a deceptive project here. It looks super simple, but what I've done here is I've got an instance of Superior Drummer, and what I've done here, this is Superior Drummer 2, so let's open it up there. Oh, come on, open up, there we are. And so what I've done is gone into the mixer and I've gone over to all of the ambient tracks. Whoops, where'd they go? There they are. And I have turned on, I've done select all, and I've turned on all the bleed. Now I think the bleed is already on for at least one of these uh, ambient mic, like the room mics, but I've gone and made sure that all the bleed is on on all of the uh, ambient tracks here. And so that's just gonna load a whole bunch of samples and you can see under this total right here, uh, we're using you know, almost one and a half gig of memory just for this one instance of Superior Drummer. Now you might notice this uh, loaded here, 2940, it's like double that, why is that? Well, that's because I was just messing around and I ended up duplicating this track. There's no MIDI data uh, on the track or anything, so it's not gonna play anything, but it is another identical instance of Superior Drummer. And so it, it, it'll have the same thing, all that bleed is gonna be on. Uh, and so basically we have two full instances. This was just to, just as kind of a stress test to see uh, if we could have two fully articulated and fully, uh, you know, decked out uh, instances of uh, drum sample library loaded into memory. And if we take a look uh, at our memory here, you know, yeah, so we're, we're using, you know, a little over half of the, of the memory. So you can kind of see how uh, eight gig of RAM could be a, a bit of a limitation if this is the kind of stuff that you're planning on doing. Uh, for most of us, I, I don't really have more than one drum set, uh, at least not more than, more than one like sample driven library. I might have like more of a, um, like a, a synth kind of a drum kit in there, but those aren't really memory intensive. Um, so yeah, this was just kind of like more of a academic exercise in anything. Uh, so also in this project I've got a uh, an audio track which is a bass guitar uh, and then I have a few tracks of uh, software synth and so these are all from the Archeria V collection so these aren't sample based uh, this is Archeria's Farfisa and uh, these are actually just uh, you know real-time synthesis kind of thing so these give a little bit more of a workout to the CPU uh, rather than taking RAM. So uh, they're a little bit uh, more demanding when you play them back uh, rather th and, and also when you monitor them, if you monitor th uh, through software. Uh, that's where those are a little more demanding. Okay, so some other things that might uh, end up being kind of CPU intensive would be things, uh, modulation uh, effects like reverbs and delays and things like that. Uh, those tend to be a little CPU intensive, uh, not memory intensive really. Uh, so uh, depending on how much uh, overhead you have, so how much overhead do we have just here at idle? So with, with Reaper doing nothing, uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're chewing up, you know, getting close to half of the CPU here. Uh, and what's, what you'll notice, it, if you ever hit 100% CPU util, utilization, that's when you start running into troubles. Um, so I, I, we've got plenty of overhead here. We, uh, we should be fine. Um, what we have is for the Roland Rubix 22, for its ASIO buffer size, we have it at 80 samples. 
and that is set through uh, Roland's uh, buffer settings and their control panel. That's USB streaming mode 1, which is the fastest, lowest latency, smallest buffer size. Uh, so this is like as high performance as it gets. And so that's yielding about 3.4 milliseconds of latency in each direction. So less than, than 7 milliseconds uh, round trip, uh, which is pretty fantastic uh, if you can get away with it. And I think what we'll see here is that, yeah, we can get away with it. We've got enough overhead in our CPU. Uh, we can have that nice uh, small ASIO buffer and uh, get that nice low latency and not have to worry about it, even in a project that's, that's kind of actively trying to chew up CPU cycles and RAM. So let's just have a quick listen at this goofy little project here. Actually, you probably already heard it during the time lapse, but uh, here it is in an earlier incarnation, I'm sure, than uh, when you would have heard it. But let's just uh, take a, have a listen here. So I'm going to start it off. Yeah, that's great. I didn't hear any pops. I didn't hear any clicks, no stutters, no dropouts. Uh, and actually, let's take a quick look at what the CPU was doing. Yeah, see, they didn't like spike the CPU or anything. Uh, we're still under about the same CPU load as we were uh, when we were not playing. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's pretty darn good. Um, so for that super low latency and everything, um, I have to say this little computer is uh, looking kind of like a, you know, a pretty mean little beast as far as a budget build uh, for home recording. All right, well, I'm going to wrap this up here. So we did it. We set a budget. We designed a build, uh, uh, went over the component selection and everything, got it put together, got it configured, and got it tested. And it actually, I think it works great. I'm actually kind of proud of this little machine. Um, it's certainly not much to look at, especially inside. Um, but uh, for all of the tasks that you could throw at it for a an average to even above average uh, home recording kind of project, uh, yeah, I have a feeling this guy is probably not going to give you too many problems. And there's still some room for expandability. You know, if, if the uh, CPU does become a problem, you can uh, always toss a graphics card in here. Uh, you know, that just wasn't in the budget for this, uh, but that'll offload some of the processing off the CPU and give it a little bit of a break. If the storage isn't enough, there's plenty of SATA slots in there, so you can toss a few more disk drives in here and expand your storage. There's three DIMM slots uh, still available for RAM, so you can get it up to 32 gigs of RAM and uh, expand it there. So there's plenty of room for growth here. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, connectivity, on the, <laughs> connectivity on the back. Like right now, uh, I've got it, oh, let's see. I've got a monitor plugged in, I'm charging a tablet. I've got one dongle for the keyboard and one dongle for uh, the mouse. I've got uh, the Roland Rubik's 22 plugged in. And I have, uh, oh yeah, and, and my uh, uh, Impact 25 uh, plugged in there. Uh, what else? It seems like I had something else plugged in there too. Oh yeah, and I also have an HDMI out going uh, for the screen capture that you're seeing. So this thing is just jam-packed and back. It's got a lot going on. Uh, and, um, you know, it seems to be working well. It's still got a couple of uh, USB 3 uh, ports in the front here that are available for it. So plenty of expansion and plenty of room for growth. All right, well, so I, I'm, I'm going to keep this computer for another, um, uh, you know, probably another couple of months here and keep testing it, keep pushing it, keep seeing if I can find any reason why it would not perform uh, as a home recording computer. And when I'm done and have made a couple more videos about it and when I'm satisfied that uh, it, it is everything that it could be, I'm going to give it away. I'm going to give it away to one of you. So uh, keep an eye out for that giveaway here uh, down the road a little ways. And I uh, hope you're looking forward to that. I know I am looking forward to that. I can't wait to get this into one of your hands, into one of your studios. Uh, I'm going to have to limit it to residents of the U.S. because this thing is just big and heavy enough that uh, shipping it overseas would cost a fortune. So keep an eye out for that. And until then, I guess I will talk to you guys next time.